Allah's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. I'd like to welcome you back to part two of our conversation that we've, we're having tonight. We're having a wonderful conversation for those of you who were available for part one. Uh, you know it was a good conversation and we're going to extend that conversation. It was just that good. For those who might have missed the first part of our program, this program is a discussion on interfaith. Interfaith in the Muslim community, between the Muslim community and others, with the central focus being the works of the leadership of Imam Wadati Muhammad and how that work played out to create the interfaith world that we have here in America, at least today, as well as other places on the planet. Uh, very important that we as Muslims understand our relationship between other members of the faith community as well as our responsibility to those who may benefit from the good relationships that we foster with other people of the faith that may not be people of faith at all. So tonight we're talking with three very experienced, very knowledgeable and committed imams from the California area. We're talking to my extreme right, uh, Imam Ab Abu Qadir El Amin, and to his left we have Imam Anta Jana, and we have to his left Imam Rahib Abdul Jabbar, and I am Imam Mikhail Hamid Shabazz. I'm the only one actually not from uh, the California area. I'm from the state of Oregon. I'm the director of the Oregon Islamic Chaplains Organization and an Imam in that area as well, and a follower or student of Imam Wadati Muhammad. So I would like to return our conversation as we concluded uh, part one. Uh, Imam Abdul Jabbar. We were discussing interfaith, intrafaith, and the impact that is positive and sometimes contentious uh, relationships that foster from that uh, in part one. And we just began to address the issue of a more intimate nature, and that is how do we, as a faith community, take life and the valuable engagements of life and move them to another level. In all of three faith communi communities that I've mentioned, and I'm not excluding others, uh, but in the Judaic Christian and the Abrahamic Christian Muslim and Jewish communities, the concept of marriage uh, is solid, mm -hmm. it's solid. But there are also restrictions in the mechanics of marriage. Muslims are allowed to marry specific ways and to specific individual Muslims. And there are also, also some restrictions. Mm. And when we talk about interfaith, and we talk about this uh, working together, living together, sharing together, at some point we're going to start loving each other together. And that's going to lead to the desire to marry, the desire to procreate, the desire to move life to another level, the desire to move life to God's intended level. Right. How right. do we handle that? What, what are the, the dynamics and mechanics of interfaith marriage among Muslims? Well, um, that's, a heavy, that's a heavy question there, Brother Imam. But um, as we know, <clears throat> in the Abrahamic faiths, um, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, there are sciences or um, as we would call schools of thoughts. In Arabic, it's called methabs. And <clears throat> coming from the tradition of the Prophet Wasallam, we know that the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, married outside uh, of the faith of Islam because at that particular time, Islam was developing. It was in its early stages. So when he married, uh, a Jew or a Coptic woman or Coptic uh, Christian who believes in the monotheistic way of believing in God, not in the Trinitary concept, those uh, marriages was done for political reasons and to also bring tribes together. <clears throat> Where we are now in 2017, that is um, much more um, difficult to do. Um, from the aspect of Islam. And the reason why I said that is because even though, as you say, we'll get together in this, that, and the other, and we're going to start loving each other in procreation, even in the, in the common sense of Islam, 
if in our particular case we, we are for men, in most marital conceptions, the woman would most likely follow her man in that religion. Sometimes that is uh, not possible or the two people become very um, stubborn, for lack of a better word, in their orientation of their life. In those particular instances, you're going to have differences of opinion as far as how we going to raise a child. Is the child, as we as Muslims do not celebrate Christmas, so are we going to allow our child to celebrate Christmas? Are we going to allow our child to go to church? Are we going to allow our, our child to do this? And whereas the mother um, is saying something else. So for us in Islam, we have to adhere to the Quran um, and not be ashamed of that. And in the Quran, Allah Ta'ala tells us that uh, a believing woman or a believing man uh, is better. But even Allah goes on to say that a, a slave, a believing slave, is better to marry than it is a non-believer. So in this particular case, we want, it is more apt for us to have like minds in a family orientation. There's already differences between the personalities and gender and what we are bringing from our experiences. It's just um, uh, in life itself, you have these different experiences. So when a brother is going after, uh, in this particular case, from our religion's perspective, if a Muslim man is going after a woman that he has fell in love with and she may be of the church or something like that, in most of the methabs of Islam, it is more uh, dutiful for him before he marries her to teach, him the, teach her the faith of Islam and allow her to convert to Islam on her own accord. Not that she has to, but it would be more permissible in the sight of God for, for her to do that. And um, in the Quran, Allah Ta'ala tells us that the people of the book is permissible to us, but that is taken out of context in the sense of we try to apply it to the same time frame as the Prophet And that is not the time frame that we are living in at this particular time. So um, just like in Judaism, Jews cannot marry outside their religion. You know, uh, Jehovah Witnesses cannot marry outside of their religion. They would be excommunicated. So uh, that's why I, I premise what I said, that there is a difference of opinion among some Muslims, but the majority of the scholars say that that woman has to be a believing woman. Uh, and vice versa, if a Muslim female wanted to marry a non-Muslim male, in order for her to marry that man, he would have to convert to Islam. Okay. So and even in that aspect, you have an interfaith dialogue. Absolutely. Because there's going to be a dialogue <laughs> about what you believe and what I believe. You better so, believe it. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Mashallah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, this is important because as we move through uh, the discussion phase and, and, and the imams have, have addressed the fact that it's beyond narrative, it is now into work, it's into relationships, it's into the, the mechanics of life. We're in society and these things are very important, particularly with, uh, with all members of the society, but particularly with the young, young members of society because of the cross-pollination mm -hmm. that goes on mm -hmm. everywhere mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes it can be problematic. Um, <clears throat> We have in the workings of Imam Warathi Muhammad, who is the, we would say he's the forerunner. I would like to say in Portland, as a, as a student of the Imam, uh, early on, uh, when he said, do it, we just did it. We weren't close to him physically, but we followed everything he said. He said, get involved in it, understand it, and know why you're doing it, and go do it. And I, our community moved in that direction started moving in the interfaith, following the creed movements, following all the things we were supposed to do. And later on, things started to happening around the world and in America and you know, some events took place that uh, catastrophic events. And a lot of people started to come out. Some of those who may have been critical of uh, some of the, uh, the uh, forward thinking of the Imam Wadi Muhammad and, and the movement of interfaith as well as the supporting of the values of patriotism. Uh, some may have been critical of that, but after certain events took place and we realized just where we were, 
that we were in the den of leopards wearing leopard coats, so we'd better get it together. Uh, okay. Uh, many people then began to address the, the need to not just be present, but to engage and to make their intentions and, and the intentions of our faith known in terms of where we stand uh, as a, a faith community that became known. And I used to say we were country before country were cool following Imam Wadi Muhammad mm -hmm. in yeah. that lead. Yeah. Uh, Imam Antar Jana, we know that in this faith, this interfaith work, and this is really what we're talking about and, and how it has grown and relationships that have come out of it, even on the political level. Uh, I can recall when Imam Wadi Muhammad uh, was first embraced by Orrin Hatch you know, a staunch, staunch, I should say, Republican conservative. And uh, that was kind of like a, a jolt of lightning, you know, that the Republican would care anything about Muslims, but he praised uh, the work of, of our community very much. Um, there were others. There were others, prominent people, people that are not uh, whimsical thinkers, people that had a lot to invest in terms of their a lot to lose in terms of their name, their credibility, their standing in their own communities mm -hmm. that stepped out and embraced Imam Wadati Muhammad and the message more so that I want to focus on, the message that he was delivering. And one of those people was uh, Dr. Robert Shuler yes. of the Crystal Cathedral. Can you, you you've had uh, some experience in, in yeah. close working in that. Uh, yeah, and, be, and uh, but, but also, you know, Dalai Lama, I mean, the Imam met with, like you say, prominent leaders, very, very good friends with the Dalai Lama, Pope John Paul II, but uh, Robert Schuller, uh, we, were, we were with the Imam in Moreno Valley, mm -hmm. and uh, he was invited, Robert Schuller was invited to address our youth, and it was a Saturday night, and I just remember this incident, I was sitting at the Imam's table, we were, he hadn't come in yet, the security hadn't brought him in yet, and so uh, Robert Schuller started his talk, and he told the people, he said, I don't do engagements on Saturday night. He said, I got the hour of power on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. He said, I never do engagements on Saturday night. He said, but for your leader, for, for Imam Muhammad, that's why I'm here. And he was giving a speech. You know, he's a motivational speaker. He wrote the right. book, Possibility of Thinking. Yes. And, uh, and he was into his speech, and he was really, really rolling. And all of a sudden, he just stopped right in the middle of his speech. And everybody was wondering, like, what's, what's that happening? And then he left the podium. Mm -hmm. he, the, the people in the audience couldn't see Imam Muhammad that came, just came in the room. Yeah. He got off the podium, walked down to meet the Imam, to embrace him, and they hugged and the people could take pictures. Then he got back up and he started his speech again. Yeah, <laughs> you know, he just said, hey, I had to take a pause, I had to greet this man. You know? and, and, and people don't realize, you know, he was the man that, uh, that uh, Clinton, when he became president, that was his pastor he brought in, yeah. Robert Shuler. And, uh, and Imam Muhammad and Robert Shuler were really good friends, really good friends. And a lot of people don't, <clears throat> don't realize that, the relationship that Imam Muhammad had with, uh, with Dr. Shuler, the Dalai Lama, uh, uh, great leaders all, you know, all around the world. I mean, in Palestine and Israel and everywhere else around the world. He, he, he pioneered uh, the, the overlapping, uh, no, no matter what your faith was. I remember he said, remember he made a statement once, he was getting an award from a Christian leader, and he said, I hope I am to you a good Christian as you are to be a good Muslim. No, no, no. That's the kind of thing he would say, yeah, say to people, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, thinking of that, when you, when you uh, shared that with us, the thought that went to my mind was the friendship and the recognition of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by the Nugus and Nagas yes. of, of, of yes. uh, Abyssinia. Yes. You know, he recognized the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for what he was and what he is. And this was a Christian leader. Yes. This was a Christian leader. And I think it's important that we continue to dig, build, expose, revisit uh, these, the, the history of Prophet Muhammad and his sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the history of, of the Imam Wadati Muhammad to really understand the value. And the, the Quran itself yes. speaks clearly. And today, in today's world, more than ever, more than any other time that I can remember, we need to have honest, serious conversation. Everyone needs to know exactly where they stand because there are elements, yeah. there are elements that are powerful elements that would have nothing to do with what we're talking about in terms of cooperation and would use every excuse in the world 
yeah. to turn us against each other. Imam Abdul Qadir, what do you think, Abu Qadir, pardon me, yeah. what do you think, or how do you perceive the perception and why did people respond to Imam Warthi Muhammad? Why did the Dalai Lama, why did the uh, uh, Sierra uh, Lubbock of the, the uh, Fakhlari movement, why did these prominent leaders, people with these, these movements, what was it that they had in common with the message? They, were, they did not convert to Islam as we yeah, practice yeah. Islam, but they stood publicly and their followings came. What do you think they saw in Imam Warthi Muhammad's message that uh, inspired them to stand with him? Uh, I heard a, a imam from uh, Portland, who is actually from Africa, mm -hmm. uh, introduce Imam W.D. Muhammad. Actually, he was the keynote speaker at an event uh -huh. where Imam Muhammad was being uh, uh, given a public address the next day. Mm -hmm. And it was in Portland. <laughs> and one of the things that I observed at that particular gathering, the, the Christians and the non-Muslims outnumbered the Muslims yeah. Four to one at that particular event and at the public address. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that the Imam uh, mentioned was that Imam W.D. Muhammad was a visionary leader and he was a transcendent, transcendent, trans transcendent, okay. transcendent, excuse me yeah. for, for stumbling over that word, a transcendent leader. Yes. So he thought outside the structures yeah. and his sincerity. Uh, was rewarded and it connected with other people who also were sincere. And I think the fact that he had vision for Islam that was not within the traditional thinking of the old world, nor was it in the confines of the co special community that he grew up in known as Nation of Islam that his father led. And I think because he thought outside of all of that framework, mm -hmm. he was able to connect with the vision of Muhammad the Prophet, peace sorry, be upon sorry, him, sorry, sorry. and use his own authentic self to introduce that from himself, not from other people's uh, structured thinking, like with the madhabs. The madhabs is developed addressing certain circumstances that existed in those environments. The word madhab comes from a word dhahaba, which means to see which way you go. It went that way. Well, it went that way because it was on a hill. So parking on a hill, you're going to have some different rules about parking on a hill than you would on flat ground. So those differences came out of a particular environment. Imam Muhammad was wise enough to know that we're in this environment. We have to... Uh, uh, design our efforts respecting the environment and the community that we're in. Mm -hmm. And I think he was visionary in that sp aspect. And he wanted to see us make our contribution for our authentic selves. Not to dress like we were from somewhere else, but to develop our own tastes, yeah. develop our own food, develop our own uh, schools, develop, build our own <clears throat> businesses. Uh, mm -hmm. Looking at how other people recognize Imam <laughs> W.D. Muhammad I don't know of any other Muslim leaders in America or the world who've been on the front page of the Wall Street Journal except Imam W.D. Muhammad because of his efforts to evolve our community economically to be responsible for developing business and, 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 and transforming poor communities into productive communities. So he was re recognized for that. And uh, people love champions. Yeah. Mm. You know, people love champions. People love people who uh, face great odds and, and win over against those great odds. Some people thought he wouldn't last three years mm -hmm. with his work of transforming the nation of Islam to bring us to the universal mm -hmm. message mm -hmm. of Islam. And people, originally, they were criticizing him. And he came forward and he said, I hear the critics. And the Quran said, don't fear the criticizing of the criticizers. You know, he said, they're trying to tell me about this baby that's being born. The baby hasn't even been born yet, and they're saying it's ugly. <laughs> it hasn't even came out. <laughs> so give us time. And, and time has proven that his methodology was, was proper. Not only was it proper for us, now we see 
the rest of the Muslim community, I'll say immigrant community, who are now seeing the wisdom of him being patriotic when it wasn't out of expediency. Yes. When he picked up the flag, when many of us were having a hard time, even some mm -hmm. of us had a hard mm -hmm. time with him picking up the flag because we have a history and we have a relationship with the flag and with this country, but he was saying it's still our country. Mm -hmm. So we have to accept it and, and then make our contribution to making it better. Mm -hmm. So because of his courage, because of his faith, I believe he, he won a lot of admirers and supporters because of his deep conviction and his sincerity. Beautiful. And yeah. humility. I can't, humility. I can't uh, leave that out because yes. out of leaders that I've met around the world, he was such a humble person. He wasn't, he didn't have heirs, he didn't have big entourage. You know, even when he was threatened, he said, well, ain't no guards at my house. I empty the garbage, I go to the store. He was not a fearful man. <laughs> he was courageous. And uh, he stood up for his beliefs. Alhamdulillah. Well, once again, time has taken its right over us and uh, moved us right on to the point where we are about to wrap up this, this section. But before we do, I think it's only fit and proper, since I am the host, even though I'm a visitor, that uh, I'd like to give each of Imam uh, time for a few closing words on the subject from your own perspective and your choice. Starting with my Imam here to my right, Imam Ab Rakib Abdul Jabbar. MashaAllah. Um, thank you for coming down and, and hosting the show for us, Brother Imam. And we, we pray Allah Ta'ala your trip here is, is good and, and Allah brings you back to your family in good health and good spirit. Okay. But on that note, um, we was talking about two things, interfaith, mm -hmm. our desire to uh, keep that type of dialogue present in our, in our works because it's a part of us. Yeah. That's why I said it, it just comes down to just dialogue for us. It's, it's, just, it's just something that we do. Uh, one of the things that I've heard about uh, ch uh, chaplains, Muslim chaplains in the prison systems, that we work harder than any other chaplains that's there because we, we handle everybody. Where the other chaplains will refuse to uh, preside over or just organize a, a Juma or, or a Tileen, we would go to the Wiccans, we would go to the agnostics, we would go to those who even Satan worshipers, even though we don't like it, we would still get them their time in the chapel and, and organize. Yeah. So that's, that's our thing, it just comes natural to us we make our prayers and we ask Allah to forgive us if we are doing anything wrong. The other thing was Imam W.D. Muhammad, Rahimullah. May Allah be pleased with him, mm -hmm. forgive him his shortcomings and his sins and grant him paradise. We have to recognize, I think, as a people, we have to recognize our leaders. And it's something that Abdul Qadir said, we don't need, he didn't say it, but it, it, for what I heard in my ears, we don't need validation. Allah has brought us to this deen by his right. God has brought everybody to their heart mm -hmm. and to their faith. And you should be sincere in your heart to that faith and live it to the best of your ability. And that's what Imam Muhammad's main message was. If you're going to be Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, said, whenever a Muslim decides to do something or he's entering something, he enters it to perfect it. Yeah. So we are all struggling to perfect it. And that is a universal statement for anybody, no matter what their faith is. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Alhamdulillah. Imam Anta Jana. I think, like you said, dialogue. Yeah. Having dialogue is education. Yeah. And, and when people have dialogue with Muslims, I was a chaplain for 20 years also in the California Department of Corrections, Native American, Catholic, Protestant, mm -hmm. we all work together. You know, we, 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 and I think it was the closest relationship I'd ever had mm -hmm. with, with, in interfaith, being a chaplain. But uh, the imam is the one who came into the California Department of Corrections and explained to the directors of, pr of pr prison what Islam is. And that's when the Muslim chaplains came into, because of Imam Muhammad. Yeah. They, they came, and we, we, we started the chaplaincy. Um, and so I think education, the more dialogue we have, people find out that, you know, go back to the Sumerian uh, society, go back to the Egyptian society, and bring it all the way up you know, through Judaism, Christianity, mm -hmm. and they see Islam as a progression. It's just the latest. Yeah. It's a progression of the same message, the exact same message. It is. Yeah. You know, and, and, and the more people have interacted with, you know, it's fastest growing religion in, in America. So, you know, and, you know, we know what's happening in England, but the more people get in touch with Muslims and find out 
who they are, they find out it's not like on CNN. It's not Al Qaeda. <laughs> it's not. It's not terrorism. It's not uh, ISIS. Right. Prophet Muhammad was invented humane warfare. Allah. You know, Napoleon Hill said that in his book Thinking We're Rich. You know, he invented humane warfare. And so there's rules of engagement. And what they're saying overseas is not Prophet Muhammad. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, 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 thank you. I, I, I think that dialogue for us is natural. It's important. Human beings have to communicate with one another. Yes. And because uh, we're in this peculiar circumstance that we're in, uh, we need more communication because we need to clarify much of the misinformation that is being expressed about Islam and about us as a people and about uh, the intent, uh, purpose of Islam. We are not uh, trying to dominate other people, mm. but we believe we have a right to establish our life as we see fit uh, within the confines of this government. We have no ill intent toward uh, uh, overtaking the government, except that we want to make the government better. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there are some areas of the government that needs improvement, just like some of our streets need improvement. We're not mad at streets, but we don't want to hit potholes. <laughs> <laughs> and the same thing with uh, uh, the functions of government on a higher level. We don't want to run into uh, things that, that, that are, are injurious to the citizens of this country <clears throat> and the world's citizenry as well. So we're in a unique position. I remember when uh, one of the times I first got involved with interfaith work in the early 90s, where it was more intense, uh, with the San Francisco Foundation's leadership group, interfaith leadership group. Mm -hmm. And uh, I explained why I was there. I said, Imam W.D. Muhammad explained, uh, encouraged us to do this work. And so I'm here following in his footsteps. I don't know much about it, but I want to be involved. And I remember a Jewish lady said, we've been looking for you. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And we're still close friends. So uh, it's a pleasure. Alhamdulillah. And Islam has made family life for African Americans much better. I'd just like to close on that note. Uh, many of our families have become improved as a result of living up to the standards of Islam. Alhamdulillah. Well, thank you all very much. May Allah bless you. And I'm going to close with a statement from the reporter that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 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 the prayers and peace of God be upon him, said, the best of you are those who are most useful to society. Let's be useful. Peace be unto you. Assalamu alaikum. Mm -hmm.